I may not be seeing well, but I'm looking good. <clears throat> you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you till you take my sunshine away the other night, dear, while I was sleeping. I dreamt I held you in my arms. When I awoke, dear, I was mistaken. So I held my head and I cried, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you till you take my sunshine away. That was the song that my father sang to me every night before I went to sleep because I was afraid of the dark. I remember the day when I went to my ophthalmologist and they had this contraption looking through my eye at my destroyed optic nerve. And the doctor gasped. And I asked what was wrong. And he said, I've never seen an optic nerve as damaged as yours. What does that mean? You have terminal glaucoma. You have lost 95% of your vision. Okay, um, what's the medication that I take? You can take a medication to lower your ocular pressure, which can stop the damage or slow it, but there's no going back. There's no cure for regenerating the optic nerve. Okay, so what operation do I do? There is no operation. Well, what are you saying to me? I'm telling you the truth. You have now entered a new room and the door has closed behind you. You cannot return to the world of sight. And I said, well, are you telling me there's no hope? And he's saying, no, but I don't want you to be chained to the tyranny of hope. I don't want you to be waiting for a miracle that will never happen. The hope is there, but the hope isn't wishing it would go away or wishing that you would be delivered. The hope is how you now transform. So the reason why I'm telling you this story is because yesterday, one of the last presentations talked about recovery and how we can use the arts to recover. And the, the presenter was struggling with that word. It, it wasn't sufficient. And, and she and Gillum stood up here and they couldn't find a better word. So we're going to use it, but it, it wasn't quite right for what they wanted to capture. And I began to think about that. And I began to think about the pandemic and COVID-19 and all these public outcries of we can't wait till we can go back to normal. And there is no normal to go back to. That's not what we're talking about. Virginia Woolf once said, illness is as much part of the life course as health. It shapes us, it transforms us. It helps us become who we eventually are. And it was that word, transform, that began to sink in. When we talk about the healing power of the arts, we're not talking about curing anything. The arts will not regenerate my optic nerve. But we are talking about healing. And what does that mean? I go back to a quote from Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist who once said, loneliness is not the absence of people. Loneliness is the inability to express what matters to you most. 
And there's something about that expression that frees us, that helps us navigate, that validates what we're feeling and helps us find a way forward. How does that work? Sometimes there are no words. And when we can't find the words, maybe an artist can find them for us and guide us to that. Or maybe there are no words and the expression is a sound. It's a gesture through space. It's a framed image. Now, when I received the news of my catastrophic, catastrophic event, I immediately felt a tremendous sense of loss. 80% of the way we engage with the world in our modern society is visual. And when that's been wiped out, it's like a death. And I went through all of the processes of death. I went into denial. This is not happening. I was angry. I would raise my voice up to God and yell, why me? And he would respond to this booming voice, why not you? I didn't have an answer to that. I would bargain. I would think, oh, well, maybe if I ate something different, if I ate whole grains, you know, maybe my optic nerve would regenerate. No, it didn't. And then eventually acceptance. And for me, acceptance was that moment when my doctor said to me, part of the transformation for you is to adopt the assistive technology, to wear the tinted lenses, to have the cane, to e even wear the hat, which helps with the glare of the harsh lighting that preserves that 5% grasping at visual straws. And I thought, no, <laughs> that's not me. I, you, you want me to go to the corner with a little tin cup and sell pencils? I mean, no, I, I'm not a blind man. That is not who I am. And he said, well, think about it and come back in a month and we'll discuss it again. And I came back in a month and it was around Christmas time and he said, what's this on your forehead? And I said, I don't know. And he held up a mirror and I looked and I saw a string of bruises, each a different color, a red one, a green one, a blue one, a purple one, like a string of Christmas tree lights. And he said, what are these? I said, oh, well, this is uh, from the corner of my kitchen cabinet. Uh, this one was when I tried to plug in an electrical uh, cord into the socket and I hit my head against the wall. Uh, this one was when I fell down the stairs. Uh, this one was when I ran into a lamppost. And he said, you have to start using the cane. And that was the first step of my acceptance, of my transformation. But even so, as I began to adapt and manage, there was that terrible sense of loss, the sense that when my sons left that Christmas, I would literally potentially never see their faces again. And then the worry about the future. How was I going to fulfill my job? I had just started this program in arts and health. I was imagining the jokes. Oh, only the UN would put a blind man in charge of the arts. How was I going to accomplish this? And I did. The program has been successful. In some ways, I felt I didn't share 100% in it because I literally didn't see it. But it has been a success. We, in 2019, published the first WHO report on the evidence base for the health benefits of the arts. And it was like a, a banner that we planted in the sand. And although it was not comprehensive, it didn't cover arts therapies and other parts. It was WHO making an initial statement on this and all these groups around the world that felt that they were working alone suddenly heard WHO saying, we're learning how to do this too. We understand. And a community, a global community began to form. Now the arts 
use for health is nothing new at WHO. We've been doing it since 1948, but it was always in a health promotional context. What makes this new is that it's not just about a health message embedded into an artistic event, but the intrinsic health value of engaging in the arts in the first place, whether it's an overt therapeutic objective or not. Even if there is no health content to it, there is a health aspect. What that is became the subject of our program. I, we have been building slowly a network of research centers around the world. The first was UCL in London, the second NYU. We also have the University of Hong Kong. Uh, we're talking to the uh, Free State University in Lagos in Nigeria, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, an impressive array of research centers looking at effective practice of arts uh, interventions in a health context. And that can be in a hospital, but it can be in a community center, it can be in a museum. But it's more than just scalable, effective approaches. It's more than just evaluation. It's also looking at the primary science of why it works. When Dr. Tedros, the DG, invited me into his office to make my pitch for this program, my argument was pretty much a health promotional argument. I said, we know that evidence, data, and information are essential for identifying objective scientific truth, for problem solving, for saving lives. But we also know that data, evidence, and information by themselves are often insufficient to change people's opinions and deeply held convictions. For that, we need empathy, often in the form of a story. And he agreed. But the unasked question in that is why? Why is it that in the pandemic, WHO could present the current state of the evidence and guidance of washing your hands, distancing, uh, staying at home, and yet misinformation sprouted up like mushrooms? Weren't the facts enough? Wasn't the clear communication of what we don't know enough? No, it wasn't. Why? So, what we found in the years that we've created this program, and just as a spoiler alert, um, on Monday in New York at the National Arts Club, I'm flying out to New York and we're going to launch our new uh, arts and health lab. Shh, it's embargoed, so don't <laughs> tell anyone. Um, but it is this network and, uh, and the idea <laughs> is to invest in robust randomized controlled trials and other uh, appropriate forms to build up that evidence base of scalable uh, approaches of arts for health's benefit. And over time, to gather that evidence, come up with recommendations, and then potentially hold the first meeting of ministers of health and ministers of culture in the same room, present that evidence with our advice, and then ideally trigger a huge investment in arts institutions, not for cultural preservation, not for the creative economy, but for the health of communities. That's the dream. So how does that work? What, what is that triangle between practice, research, and policy that can get us there? Uh, I'll use a single WHO example. A number of years ago, uh, and this was shepherded by our Copenhagen office, uh, there was a small randomized control trial in the UK called uh, Music for Mums. And it was a program to use music to uh, help people, uh, young mothers who are living with, who are experiencing postpartum depression. And could music help? And in this controlled trial, you had a controlled group where it was traditional therapy, uh, another group where they used play groups, uh, and so did that diminish some of the symptoms? Did that have an effect? And in the third, it was a singing group where mothers would gather together and sing with their children, but sing with each other as well. And what we saw in terms of the data was that the music group had a significant 
more positive effect than the other two groups. And that was enough information for us through WHO to convince Romania, Denmark, and then eventually Italy to try their own trials, all along inviting the EU as observers, as participants in this, so that when the data comes out of these other trials in this different context, different cultural contexts, um, is there an opportunity to roll this out across Europe? And then through WHO, potentially in other regions and the world. So that's how that virtuous triangle works of practice, research to policy. To do that, you have to have robust measurement mechanisms. You have to have research centers allied with practitioners. You have to have engaged policymakers. And even in just yesterday, seeing the Catalan Minister uh, of Health, uh, the Public Health Secretary here, um, the, the few conversations we've had with uh, academic institutions, the museum itself, uh, NGOs, you have all the pieces here. The question is, can you put them together for that kind of a robust program? And that's the challenge that I would be laying out to you. But for me, it wasn't just measurement. It wasn't just the RCT, because when you started talking to the actual participants, some of the information we were receiving were things that we weren't measuring. So they would talk about, you know, one of the reporters would ask one of the women, um, so do you still keep in touch with people? Almost all of the women in these uh, sessions said yes, which begs the question, why weren't we measuring that? We were measuring the deficits, the reductions of symptoms. We weren't measuring the assets. And that actually is the most significant part of an artistic intervention. It's not just simply the reduction of symptoms. It's, am I coping with the everyday stresses of life? Am I practicing my abilities to their highest degree? Am I productive? Am I participating in a community? Is that community forming with, with my involvement and lasting? Am I finding moments of joy? If the answers to all of these questions are yes, then according to WHO's definition of mental health, you have mental health regardless of your diagnosable condition. And when you explain that to someone who is suffering from depression or uh, Alzheimer's or any other condition, it is such a relief because they've become convinced in our society that the only success is a cure. But that's not the lesson of the arts. We have to have these asset measures. Do we begin to trust again? Do we have a sense of belonging? We need to measure this as well. But why does music have this effect? Well, looking, working with some of our neurology partners, we can actually see how more than just a reduction of cortisol, you know, uh, reducing stress, which is significant, but again, it's a deficit measure. We see that in the musical line, as we hear that song being sung, there's an anticipation that happens which triggers a dopamine effect. And when we reach the climax of that song, where it has come to a conclusion that surprised us, it wasn't what we were expecting, but it makes sense with everything that happened before, it triggers an oxytocin reaction, which is the bonding hormone it helps support that sense of community, which is why in a room like this, we begin to not only hear the information, but the mirror neurons in our midbrains begin to align. We begin to form a sense of community. It's working on a neurological level in a totally different way than information does. Information is, is processed in the frontal cortex, the seat of our conscious mind. But this kind of emotional intelligence and connection is with the amygdala. It's in the midbrain, the seat of identity, the seat of personal choice and where we create our realities. 
And that's why when I tell you a fact, you may or may not respond to that. But if I can make you feel, then suddenly our realities begin to merge. And it's not a didactic change. It's not the kind of behavioral change that we're used to talking about in public health. Um, I'd like to frame it maybe in too simplistic a way between um, propaganda and the deep aesthetic experience. Propaganda is usually fear-based, uh, even if it's for a positive intention, like uh, the uh, packaging on cigarettes showing the cancerous mouth. Um, the data is correct. Uh, smoking causes cancer and we want people to stop. But by putting that photo on it and triggering responses of fear and disgust, what's happening neurologically is that those cortisol and adrenaline levels go up and it has a depressive effect on our prefrontal cortex, our center of judgment, and we become susceptible to suggestion, to change. But it's a manipulation. In the deep aesthetic experience, we have the mirror neurons being created in the midbrain. And instead of a suggestion, what happens is that information gets interpreted through the filter of our own experiences, our own imagination. And the meaning is a collaboration with the artist, but is significantly ours, which is why artists often say, it's not our job to give you the answers. It's our job to ask the question. And they're not being coy. It's because they know if they do their job right, they have no control over the meaning you take away from it. It has to be that dance. How can we separate the dance from the dancer? As Yates said. So in practice, what does this mean in projects around the world? Uh, I was asked to be involved in uh, something called the Yazidi Cultural Archive, which was a collaboration with Google Arts. You can look it up online. And the idea there was uh, originally to bring in professional photographers and anthropologists uh, to uh, work with women who had been held in captivity under ISIS uh, and to preserve elements of the culture that were on the verge of extinction. And, uh, and I remember looking at that plan and thinking, um, you know, and we were asked to be involved, and I said, this is great, I can't wait to see the outcome, but um, you know, it's not something WHO can really be involved with. And they said, well, what would we need to change? And I said, don't hire the professional photographers. Give the cameras to the women. Let them decide. Don't objectify them again by putting them on the receiving end of a camera. Put them behind the camera. Let them choose. And the result was not just this beautiful collection preserving culture, but it was a process for them individually to start imagining what their identity could be in the future. To start reflecting on their own bodies, their own relationships, and finding that their body was a safe place again through this process. I worked with children in Moldova uh, who had recently come back from, uh, who had recently escaped the war in uh, Ukraine. And I was working with a clowning organization. And it was, it was very interesting because these children often would have dark circles under their eyes. They hadn't slept in a long time. Uh, they didn't play. Um, there, there were very specific behaviors that suggested that they had been through a very difficult time. And the clowns began to engage with the children. And at first, when they began to engage, the children weren't sure how to respond. And then at the first pratfall, one child would begin to laugh. And it would begin to spread virally. And, it, and the sound was like the first spring rain on the desert. 
And the smiles that would erupt on their faces were like the flowers suddenly blooming. And the mothers began to cry because they hadn't heard that sound in months. The healing power of humor is something we often forget about. So, museums have always been an important part of my life. Um, my father was an art conservator, and so uh, for me, a museum was going to see my father at his place of work. And uh, sometimes, on a rare occasion, he would walk through the galleries with me. And for him, paintings were not images. Paintings were objects. So he would come up and show me the actual paint on the canvas and describe to me the, the chemistry of how those paints were mixed and how the canvas was stretched and uh, the brush strokes. So it was almost like a sculpture you know, for its own sake. Uh, he would also talk about what the Renaissance artists would do and, and how Raphael would uh, he would say Raphael was not, he was always described as a realist, but he wasn't. He was an abstract painter. And of course, as a kid, I didn't quite know what he meant. But he said, you know, people stand like this, but Raphael painted them in a corkscrew like this. Nobody stands like that. But he did it as a trick so that it would have a sense of motion. And so this is how I began to enter the world of realism versus fantasy what we see and what our mind creates. Um, <clears throat> and mu museums were always a refuge for me, uh, a safe place. It was, I always associated it with my father and, and my aesthetic awakening. When we began to engage in museums in this work, um, it was at the beginning of the pandemic and a lot of the museums were facing a crisis. They were closed. How, how, and even before the pandemic, there was a sense of they needed to rethink their mission. And, and some of the museums we got into dialogue with, uh, the Museum of Modern Art was one of the first in New York to actually change their mission statement to include wellness. Uh, and that was based on a program that they started of bringing in people with dementia and having them start relating to some of the paintings. And what was interesting about that program was that there was no claim that this process reversed or slowed the condition. Um, and in fact, there is no evidence that it does. But there is evidence, if you look for it, if you measure it, of these moments of recognition, of connection, of memory, the relaxation of the facial, facial muscles from uh, 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 an existential terror, because part of what happens with some forms of dementia is you lose your conception of time. So you always feel like you're just waking up and you don't know what you've just lost or you're dreading what's going to happen next. And in a way, the temporal lobe of the brain, as, as great of an asset as it is to humans uh, to create a falsely linear conception of time and how that helps us learn from the past and plan for the future, it was also, it, it came at a terrible cost because with our sense of time came also a sense of loss and a sense of disrecognized. This. this is the source of most human suffering. And so with Alzheimer's disease, that becomes very apparent. They're living in this netherworld where that sense of time has fallen apart. And even in our contemporary society, we've spent so much time thinking about what we've lost, thinking about what might be coming, that we spend very little time in that present moment. And there's something about that aesthetic experience that reconnects time. Being in that present moment connecting to the past, imagining a future, heals broken time. So when these museums began to come to me, I said, uh, you know, and they were asking very specific questions. Can we rethink the purpose of the museum from simply being repositories of valuable objects to being centers of community? Can we be a healing center? 
And my response, because I like being the devil's advocate, was, are you sure you want to heal the community? Isn't this more about healing yourselves? And they, you know, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, look at the history of museums. Museums in their antecedent began as bastions of empire. When the great empires were first formed, what did they do? They took these art objects from the conquered peoples and paraded them through the town under the Arc de Triomphe and whatever else. And usually these objects, their original purpose was a healing purpose. But by capturing them and publicly displaying them to the populace and then housing them in the palace, what eventually became the museum, it was a symbolic form of showing dominion over a conquered people. And even in modern times, when U.S. museums would uh, be created in the 19th century, uh, it, it was a corporate form of this. They would build new museums that looked like the European palaces, and they would intentionally have collections from around the world to show economic dominion and cultural dominion over people. So part of this transformation isn't just remarketing yourselves to help heal the community. You have to do this to heal yourselves. You have to go back to your collections and see what these objects originally were meant to do and embrace that. Go back to the healing power of those objects. And there's been a receptive response all around the world. Now, for me, I had difficulty in these conversations, too, because I did grow up in museums. They gave me such pleasure, and I could no longer enjoy them. I was afraid to go into the museums because I couldn't see those images that gave me such pleasure. And a number of years ago, right before the pandemic, I was going to give a performance at the Wellcome Trust in London, uh, presenting my new strategy. And what I've always done before a performance is I, I like to take a walk, I like to listen to music, uh, to get into the zone. And so I'm walking through London and uh, I'm uh, wanting to go to uh, the St. Martin's in the Fields to hear a, a, a midday concert. Because part of the music to me, especially in my state of limited vision, is to hear that music inhabit the physical space around me uh, and using my newfound echolocation to have these moments of sight through sound. And, and that's a transformative process for me. But on that day, I'm walking through Trafalgar Square before the lockdown, and there's a huge crowd of people there, and I'm being buffeted about, I'm getting disoriented, I'm like this flotsam in the stormy sea of humanity, and I wash up on the wrong side of the square and my heart is pounding, I'm sweating, I'm, I'm feeling the state of anxiety. I'm having a panic attack. And when I realize that I'm not only on the wrong side of the square, but I'm in front of the National Gallery, which I'd been avoiding for years, my heart sank. But I thought to escape the crowd, I'm gonna go inside and just take refuge. So I go into the gallery and I'm wandering around and I'm trying to remember where I am. I, I, I'm alone, I'm disoriented. And I end up in this gallery with these monumental canvases. And I'm looking at them and I'm trying to recognize them. And I, and I see fog, I see rain, I see sailing ships, I see tangled humanity uh, on the ships, um, the this, this storm of oceans of, of gloom. And I realize that I'm in the Turner Room. And as I'm looking at these paintings and seeing this vision of this long dead artist, the object he created, and my own experience reflecting in that moment of looking at it, I began to taste salt water on my cheeks. And for a moment I thought it was the salt spray of the mist of the paintings and I realized it was the tears running down because I realized at that moment for the first time, looking through Turner's vision, 
the way he saw the world was identical to the way I saw the world now through my glaucoma. And for the first time, I could imagine that it was beautiful. There was something about the triangulation between this long dead artist, the object, and my own experience that offered a kind of triangulation to navigate the stormy seas of my personal catastrophe to find a safe haven. Just as you willingly close your eyes to better savor a glass of red wine. Just as you willingly close your eyes to better embody a beautiful piece of music. Just as you willingly close your eyes to trace the gentle slope of a lover's forearm. So too do I now accept the closing of my eyes to better share this moment with you.